God then, not being able to spare wrath, sends Christ in the flesh and crushes him. And in so doing, pours out his wrath against the children of God onto his son, killing him. But then God raises him from the dead. And that same power that raised Christ from the dead is now at work within those who would believe. And this is the gospel. There we go. So, a number of years ago, many years ago, um, when I was in high school, they, uh, they, they used to do, I don't, honestly, I don't know if they still do it anymore. Do, do they still do driver's ed in high school? Is that, no? Okay. So, I, I took driver's ed in high school. Um, and so, as a 15-year-old, I was in class and um, it was it was led by this guy who man this guy God bless him but he was like old as dirt I'm pretty sure he smoked in class um, and did not care and we were all like are we really gonna be safe out there and he's like yeah no like, okay um, but for one of the requirements that he he gave us is we needed to shoot a video or make a presentation about unsafe driving. And so I figured like, okay, this should be easy enough. And so I was trying to think about like how I could pull this off in a very uh, elaborate way, which should shock nobody. And so um, I remembered that down the street from my house lived Dan, uh, Dan Lobster, I believe his last name was, and he worked for the highway patrol. Now, we had a, a good relationship with Dan, and so I remember one day I, I went over to his house and I said, hey Dan, I have to do this video for my driver's ed class. Would you be willing to help me? And he was like, yeah, how so? I said, well, I'm just gonna set the scene for me like breaking the law, and then I need you to come and arrest me. And he said, yeah man, I got you. And I was like, awesome. So. We set the whole scene. One day after work, he comes down and he parks his patrol car around the corner. And I forget who it was, my mom or dad or whatever. They have the handy cam. You know, this is a big handy cam. And, and, they're, and they're filming. And I'm in, in my parents' car parked on the driveway because I'm 15. I'm parked on, on the driveway doing things that are illegal. And then out of nowhere, you hear him fire up the siren and come tearing around the street and come in behind us. Now, at this moment, a couple things failed to happen. Number one, I failed to tell my neighbors. <clears throat> By the way, I do have this all on video. I thought briefly about showing it to you, and then remembered I still want to have some measure of dignity left in this job, uh, so I'm not showing it to you. Um, so immediately, all the neighbors come out, and they are watching the good little Christian boy get hooked for driving at 15. So, so there I am, right, and he comes up, and he comes up to the window, and he's doing his little script, you know, and I said, oh, you know, do you have a driver's license? No, I don't, I don't have a driver's license. Uh, do you have a permit? No, I don't even have a permit. All right, would you step out of the car? And I said, sure, and, so, and there's my dad, you know, taking the film. And, and so uh, the neighbors didn't think it was weird why my dad was filming me being arrested. Um, so... As I get out of the car, he starts to question me. Now, remember, I'm 15, and this is like a friend of mine, but his patrol car is still on, and he is still very much in uniform. And so I start kind of shaking. And he looks at me and asks me a series of questions, and then he says, would you turn around and place your hands behind your head? Now, at this moment, there are certain things that happen to men and women in law enforcement when they just go into autopilot. This happened. So as I turned around, he places his hand on the back of my head, kicks my foot out, pulls me down, and I'm like, Ugh, boom, on the back of my car, right? And just lays me out and then takes me and throws me into the back of his patrol car, gets in and drives off. 
like I said, we have it, we have it all on film, and it is it is incredible. And my dad, as it was like, great shot, great shot, right? And all the neighbors were like, what is happening? We had to go back around and explain it all. But point being is there was something about him doing that job for so many years that it was something new and, you know, to go and, like, play act uh, to the neighbor kid. But then at some point, and you can see it in his face when it happened, at some point he switches into, this is what I've done a million times, and I don't even have to think, and I just do it without, without putting any other thought to it. It just became second nature to him. And there are things in your life, whether you like it or not, that are just second nature to you. And they don't have to be arresting people and throwing them in the back of a patrol car. It'd be like brushing your teeth. Like you don't have to think like left, right, left, right. right? I mean, that would be ridiculous. But you just know. And wouldn't it be great if there were certain things in your life that were byproducts of following after Jesus that just became second nature? That you didn't have to, you know, work at it so hard. Over the last about four or five weeks, we've been talking through this book of Galatians and talking about the juxtaposition of two things <clears throat> that the Apostle Paul is trying to challenge the church of Galatia in, and that is the difference between following God with grace and following God with law. Grace being that we recognize that there is nothing we can bring to the table and that God's grace is big enough for us and that our job is just to be as best as we possibly can, obedient to him, recognizing that Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, his sacrifice is enough to cover our sin. And just because of that, it gives us a right standing before God. Versus saying, well, there are 600 rules, laws in the Bible, and if I follow all of those perfectly, then I'll be accepted by God. And if I don't, he'll be a little more upset with me, and I'll just kind of play this balance with God to make sure I'm good enough by the time I die. Have you ever wondered how God actually works in the world and like gets those things that he desires out of us into the world? Because, you know, he could just intervene and just do what he wants. He doesn't need us. But the beautiful thing is he chooses to use us. I often illustrate it this way. Like if I have an itch on the top of my head, my body is fully capable of sending an electrical impulse up to my scalp to go, that's an itch, do away with it. Fully capable. But it doesn't. It chooses to send the impulse through my arm, down to my fingers, to use my hand to go up and say, it's all good. That's just an itch. It can go away now. In the same way, God can just say, boom, done, 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 done. But he chooses to send you and I. His word issues a command, and then his spirit enables us to carry those commands out. And so today, we are going to look at a passage that if you've been around church for a while, you've probably heard them alluded to or maybe spoken directly to, and that is fruit of the spirit. And I'll use this as an illustration later, but we're going to be talking about all the fruit and I'm going to go through them, each one individually. And as I do, um, th there is going to be something, that you, something unique that happens to you. And I want you to note what you think and what you feel as I go through these. And then I will tell you why what you felt and what you think is a bit misplaced. So I'm, I'm, going, to take, I'm going to take a, a, I'm going to have a big assumption that we're all going to feel the same way. Because... That's how our brains work. So let's pray, and then we're going to dive into Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. So let's pray. God, we thank you for, ah, for this beautiful day, for this morning where we can come worship you, open up your word, and see how it is that you would have us live. The type of just second nature reaction response that you would like us to have, desire us to have, enable us by your spirit to have in response to a whole variety of circumstances. So God, would you speak powerfully in a way that only you can? It's in your name we pray. Amen. All right, Galatians chapter 5, starting in verse 16. If you need a Bible, we have some at either exit. If you don't own one, grab one, take it with you. It's our gift to you. Or you can open up on the app, or they'll be up on the screen. Either way, Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. Ready to go? Let's go. 
Larry's ready. Are we ready to go? I know, I know. I, I mess it up. I know, sorry. All right, here we go. Galatians chapter 5, verse 16. But I say, this is Paul speaking, but I say, walk by the Spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the Spirit, and the desires of the Spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. Now that seems like it would be a frustrating thing, like the things of God are trying to prevent you from doing the things you want to do. But understand that his broader point is this whole notion of, hey man, do you. Be your own truth. Choose your own way. Define... What he is reminding us of that we all know to be painfully, painfully true is that if you choose to do whatever you want to do, you will choose destruction every time. If you choose to do the thing that your heart really, really, really wants to do, we don't want to be healthy. We don't want to be respectful. We don't want to be kind. We end up doing it most of the time begrudgingly. But that's what he's noting. He's saying, hey, just so you know, we all come from the same, we're cut from the same cloth. There is sin deep inside of us, and if you don't keep that restrained, that will come out of you. And God wants to use you so that people can find and follow Jesus. And if all you do is let your natural desires come out, you will be looking like the furthest thing from Jesus, just so you know. And so, what the Apostle Paul is going to talk about, he talks about uh, what the desires of the flesh are and how to rid yourself of those. I, I may bring that back up in a week or two. I may do a message on that. I'm not entirely sure yet. But I want to skip over that and get to what he talks about of how does he actually produce those things because what he wants to do is he wants to produce things in us to help. And he calls them fruit. And the fruit are really two things. They are things that reflect the character you should have and the way that we conduct ourselves, character and conduct. Now, here's a question that I just want to pose to you and allow you to think about for a moment. There was a famous writer who once said, if you were on trial for being a Christian, would there be any evidence to convict you? Which is a great way of just asking, are there things, are there fruit? Are there products in your life of following after Jesus that actually someone could point to and say, you know what, there is this aspect of this person that, yeah, it, it is painfully clear that they follow Jesus and I can tell by the evidence of the fruit in their life. And so if you were to ask, well, what kind of evidence are we talking about? Great question. I'm glad you asked. The reason that he lists these is because he knows we're going to ask. And so what he, what he lists are nine fruit of the Spirit. So here's what I want to do to end. <clears throat> I want to go through all nine. I want to talk about them. I want to try to define them. And I want you to allow yourself to go through a little bit of process of self-evaluation. And then we're going to get to application at the end. And then at the very, very end, I'm going to kind of identify the thing that we all feel when I read this list. All right? So here we go. One through nine. I'll, I'll read it first, and then, we'll, and then we'll dice them up. So Galatians chapter 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is, ready? Here we go. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There are nine. Against such things there is no law, and those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. So let's start at the beginning with love. So the first one, love, defines and sets them all off. Just so you know, these are all, well, except for two at the end, are characteristics that we see modeled in Christ. And this word love, there's multiple words for love in the Bible. This one is specifically the word agape, which means more than just <coughs> warm, fuzzy feelings. 
Like, if you think of, man, I really love you in this kind of like, oh, my, my stomach kind of turns and I get butterflies, that's not what it's talking about. What it's saying is that, it, that there is a deliberate attitude of goodwill and devotion to you. And my love is given freely to you. And I do not expect to be repaid. And number two, I do not look to see if you deserve it. Those are two very huge things that you and I, let's be honest, do not do when it comes to love. If I'm going to extend love towards you, usually the first thing I do is run you through a litmus test to see if you are worthy of it. And then I see, is this going to be a one-way street? Is this going to be a losing venture? I'm going to invest in you and you are going to do nothing. And if that is the case, then I will likely pull back because why would I expend a bunch of energy on investing in someone that isn't going to invest back. See, there are people in your life that are easy to agape love. My mom is easy to agape love. My wife is easy to agape love. My kids, depending on the day, are easy to agape love. There are people in your life. That is not what this is talking about. This is not talking about love the people that it's easy to love. This is probably most cleanly put, love your enemies. Love the people who are most difficult to love. Love the people who (coughs) culture says you should not love, that you should not talk to, that you should not associate with, that you should not go above and beyond for. Love them. It says in Romans 5.8, which I think is a beautiful way of putting this. We could throw that up there. But God shows his love for us. In that, and here's the key, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Notice was it, what it doesn't say. But God shows his agape for us in that once we got it all together, he died for us. Once we proved ourselves worthy, he died for us. Now, while we were still enemies, while we were still sinners, Christ died for us that Going back is the definition of agape. So I know, I mean, we're in fruit one, and some of you are like, oh, God, there's, there's eight more of these? Okay, all right, well, okay, and, that, and that's fine. Just note that, okay? Because it's going to get worse. Um, second, second is joy. Joy, love, then joy. Joy, very simply defined, is a gladness independent of your circumstance. A deep gladness despite your circumstance. This is not based on the reality of your life. This is based on a spiritual reality. A deep, soul-level satisfaction that all is well between you and God. That everything is good. Have you ever had that moment where you have some measure of conflict or at least assumed conflict between you and another person. And if you are a conflict avoider, which is like 85% of the world, then that has a tendency to kind of flavor everything in your life. Because like, ah man, things aren't good with... John, and it uh, just kills me. And, I, and every time you, you hear of John's name or something, or he walks by you in the office, you're like, oh man, oh man. But then something comes about and you reconcile. And in that moment, you recognize, no, actually you and John are good. And there's that, oh, that happens. That's what this is. This kind of, oh, between you and God. That even though your life could be falling apart, there is peace. There is love, there is mercy between you and God. And so we fix our focus on that, on God's purposes as opposed to our circumstances. I always find it interesting when you talk to people, not that people would answer this way, this would be kind of odd, but when you ask someone, hey, how are you doing? And they say, oh, good, doing great. And you ask, well, what's going on? Why is it so great? I've never heard someone say, because me and God are good. You know, it's like, really? Most of the time we'll say, no, we're good because, well, you know, my job's doing well. My kids' grades are up. My wife and I, we're getting along. We, we ought, and it's just programmed into us 
to align our emotional well-being with our circumstances. My circumstances are good, I'm good. My circumstances are bad, I'm bad. And the Apostle Paul would say, not for Christians, not for followers of Christ. Your circumstances could be some of the worst there ever was, but you get to experience joy because you have God on your side. And God is not your enemy. And that should be good news. It's said best this way in John 16, 20. But he said to them, it is I, do not be afraid. It's the first thing that Jesus says when he comes upon them and startles the disciples. And he says, it's me. Don't freak out. All is well. I'm not here to get on you. I'm not here to punish you. I'm not here to throw a rod at you. It's, it, I'm, it's all good. It's all good. In the same way, when, when we sense the presence of God, there's this, uh, uh, but he, he wants us rather to respond with, oh, good. My father's here and all is well. Very closely mirrored to joy is the next one. Peace. 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 Shalom. Shalom, very similarly, is not the absence of turmoil. Most of the time, that's what we believe peace is. Peace is the absence of turmoil. No, no, no. Not, not for a follower of Jesus. Peace is is a tranquility amidst the chaos. That is peace. It is a deep, soul-level contentment knowing God is on the throne, He is in control, and all is well. So again, things could be tumultuous. That, that, that's one of the things that I... It... Mm, okay, I'll, I'll say it. It genuinely it saddens me when I hear Christians say, Oh! The world is just crazy. Who knows what's going to happen? It's all so... And I just think to myself, like, well, at, at what point did, do you think God ceased being in control? Like, well, no, but like, I mean, you see the Middle East, it's never been as bad as it's been. Yes, it has. Uh, but B, uh, God is also in complete control. So all is well. Now, it doesn't mean that we don't take notice of things. It doesn't mean that we don't have just this heart-bent worry and compassion for things that are happening in our world or in even more intimately in our personal world i'm not saying that i'm not saying we're ignorant of the things that are happening but there, there there's no there's no reason to freak out literally what this word mean uh, literally this in this idea and concept is to be bound together the phrase that he's using here, to have peace, means to be bound up together. A way that we would say it in our vernacular is to have your ducks in a row or to have your stuff together. <laughs> the Apostle Paul is known for cursing in the Bible. We don't translate it that way, which is frustrating. Um, but the Apostle Paul, uh, he uses some very aggressive language that I would get emails about if I said it on stage. But that's literally what he means, is to get your stuff together. Have it, have it and keep it together. There is no reason. There is no reason. And Jesus talks about this many, many times. There is no reason for a follower of Jesus to ever be anxious or afraid. And if you are feeling any emotions or feelings of anxiety or fear, know that they are not of God. Election cycle or not. It, sh it should not matter. Because God is on the throne. And he is in control. And all is well. Okay. So we're three in. How we doing? Good? All right. Let's keep going. Number four, patience. <laughs> okay, so this is where it falls off the rails. Okay, I, I, I didn't know. I assumed maybe it was the other one. Apparently, it's patience. Okay, <laughs> patience is the one that everyone wishes was not here. Um, if you were to survey everyone and be like, which fruit of the Spirit would you like to do away with? The patience, the patience one. Um, because nobody prays for this. By the way, praying for patience is probably a mistake because guess what happens when you do that? <clears throat> He will answer you. Um, and he will give you a situation mm -hmm, mm -hmm, that you just need patience, that you need to just... Oftentimes we think of the concept of waiting when it comes with patience. But here, the, 
the, the idea that Paul is getting at is more of enduring ill treatment from life or at the hands of others without lashing back or without the desire to pay back. You just kind of take it. And there, there are many situations in life where just that long suffering is another word that the Bible uses, the long suffering endurance over a long period of time to just, just patiently wait for things to come to pass. I'll be honest with you, I think time and time again as a pastor and as a follower of Jesus, one of the things that is most frustrating to me is God's timing. Um, Because God's timing, uh, I can say with 100% certainty, is not our timing. There are things where I'm like, God, I mean, this is a pretty good deal. You should fast track this. And it either never comes to pass or takes a decade. And then um, things like, God, if we could slow our roll on that, and it happens within 24 hours. So, you know, there are things in life that we just, we have to trust the timing of God. But one of the best definitions that I ever heard of, of this, it was from uh, Willard. He said, it is a calm, a calm, willing acceptance of situations that are irritating or unpleasant. Isn't that, isn't that lovely? A calm willingness to accept situations that are irritating or unpleasant. Do you see yourself as a follower of Jesus modeling the fruit of a calm willingness, almost an invitational nature. You're like, yes, I invite irritating things all the time. That is not what I'm saying, nor is that what Paul's saying. You are not a suction cup for or a gravitational pull towards unpleasant crap in your life. That's not what he's saying. What he's saying is when those unpleasant or irritating things come, there's just a willingness to say, it's all good, man. It's all good. 1 Timothy 1, 15 and 16 says it this way. The saying is trustworthy and deserving of full acceptance that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners of whom I am the foremost. Timothy says, listen, I I am the worst of the worst and I kind of live with that my whole life. But God came to save even me and it's okay. All is well. All is well. Patience. Next one. Kindness. This one's a little easier. This one's a little easier on us. Oh, wait, sorry. I have one more verse. Yes, sorry. But I received mercy for this reason, that in me, as the foremost, Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience. I was thinking, I was like, there's an incomplete thought there. And this is it. Uh, That Jesus Christ might display his perfect patience as an example to those who, who were to believe in him for eternal life. That's what it was. That Timothy is saying, I am the worst of sinners, and he came for me, and the reason he came for me is because he wants to display his patience, and I am his art. So if you are the art of God, if you are the billboard of God's patience, how we doing? (laughs) Okay, we're going to continue. Kindness. Kindness. Um, it looks to adapt to the needs or meet the needs of other people. It is this inward moral goodness that almost overflows. Probably another way to describe it is a sweetness. Like when you say, oh, man, she's so sweet. Man, he's such a sweet guy. That, that's what this is. Just this overflowing sweetness. And there is almost... It, so, so it's not just bringing in sweetness. It is also an unwillingness to be harsh. Because there are situations and times when you would be fully justified by your employer, by your friends, by your family, just to be a jerk. And when you see that opportunity coming, you say, yeah, I'm going to let that one just pass on by. I'm not, I'm not going to take the bait on that. I'm, I'm, I'm going to be unwilling to be harsh. I don't need to be at all. Matthew 11. I don't have a verse for everyone, but many of them. Matthew 11, 20 and 29. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. You know what that is? That is a God who is good and kind. 
Because he could say, come to me and we'll, we'll talk about all the terrible things you've done. And I'll just lay it on you and you'll know. That's not what he says. But he said, nah, just come to me and I'll give you rest. I'll give you goodness. You could just, just be in the goodness and kindness of God. And that is what it is like being around a person who is just kind. Just always kind. The next one is very similar, and some, some theologians even put them together as the same that, that Paul was expounding on the last one. So they're, they're very similar. Goodness. Um, but goodness has a little bit of an edge to it, and I, I don't know that you're going to enjoy this, especially those of you who are conflict avoidant. Goodness, this is a desire to see goodness in others, but, and here's the caveat, but it is not above confronting or rebuking someone to see that goodness come about. So there are oftentimes when we see something in someone's life and we say, man, it would really be within their best interest genuinely for the good of their family, the good of the gospel, the good of everything, if they would do this. Boy, I hope they figure it out. That is not good. What is good is sitting down with them and saying, hey, I see that your, your life is, is kind of heading in this direction and I want, I want to offer you a perspective that maybe, maybe some things could change. And what it means for us sometimes is putting ourselves in some situations that they may not like and let's be honest, we may not like. Like, let me ask you a question. Have any of you ever woken up a child? Yes? It's, ter- it's the worst thing ever. Because you go in and very sweetly say, hey, it's time to get up. And what you get back, <laughs> I'm not getting up. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Okay. Um, anyway, I, I need you to get up. Now, do I need them to get up because I am cruel? No. I need them to get up because they need to go to school. And if they don't go to school on a routine basis, then they will fail out of school. If they fail out of school, that right, I'm doing this for their good. But for a moment, we will endure the brutality of getting you up out of your very warm bed. Oh, I know. And getting us into our cold, cold 70 degree house. And get out of bed so you can go down and get the breakfast your mother's prepared for you. I'm, I'm sorry, that's more of my story than the Bible story. But I'm just, <laughs> you can tell the one that I'm not good at. Um, it's just a kind gentle goodness towards my kids um but right there are elements and times in your life where you just you need to do the right and say hey this is what's best for you even when what you get back is uh what no one would describe as good faithful i i gotta i i'm running out of time so i'm gonna i'm gonna move through these a little more a little quicker all right uh what what are we at faithfulness yeah faithfulness uh, faithfulness is, um, I, I think th- this one we, we all kind of generally understand. If you, if you were to be faithful, oh, he is faithful, she is faithful. Well, that means they're, they're reliable. There, there is a, a, a true devotion to others and to Christ. Everyone knows, everyone has that person in their life that can kind of be trusted. Right? When they say, I'll be there, you can count on it. You go, eh, maybe, probably not. We all know that person. Followers of Jesus who are exemplifying the fruit of the Spirit are not that person. As Jesus would say, let your yes be yes and your no be no. If if, if, if I'm going to commit to something and do something and you have my word, then you do it. And if you say, no, I can't be there, then no, you, you say, no, I can't do that. You are a person of your word. You are reliable. You can be trusted. You are faithful. You are loyal. You are always there when you say you're going to be there, whether it be emotionally, physically, with resources, whatever it is that you commit to, Christians can be trusted, and they're going to remain faithful. Next, gentle. Now, gentle does have a kind of an air of meekness, but this is not weakness, per se. It doesn't mean that you are without power or without authority. What it means, though, is just that you, you choose to defer that power to others. And it's very little to do with outward. It's more of just this inner power of tranquility of, you know what? I, I'm, I don't need to assert my power over you. I'll just, I'll just remain gentle this 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 word is is a little difficult to to uh figure out because this one and the next one are the only two that aren't attributed to god 
God is never once called gentle. He's called a lot of things. Gentle is not one of them. But this word is used three times in the New Testament. And the three times it is used, it is used to mean a submissiveness to the will of God, a teachableness to the things of God, and a high consideration and deferral to other people. So those are the three times it's used in the New Testament other than in this list. So it's a, it's a very rare word. A lot of theologians wonder why Paul included it when he didn't talk about it in any of his other writings. But there is an element to where there is a gentle, I don't need to go in and parade myself around. Probably the, the closest place you could put to it is this air of humble humility. I'm just gentle. I, I don't need to come in and control everything. If you want to take over, that's fine. If you need the limelight, that's cool. And then the last is self-control. Self-control, which we could all use a little more of. <clears throat> self-control is releasing our grip on our desires. We, whether you would describe yourself this way or not, every single one of us, you are a control freak. Because the things that are close to you really matter to you, as in many ways they should. But not to the point that you are choosing to control them rather than to be controlled by the Holy Spirit. And that's what self-control is. The entire thing of what the Apostle Paul is telling you, telling you and I, is rather than, give, uh, rather than take control and say, I want to do the things I want to do. The things that are satisfying to me and my flesh, I'm going to do those things. Rather, he says, no, nah, I'm going I'm to let the Spirit of God dictate how my life goes. I'm going to let him choose to lead the way. Now, let's talk about how we apply these things. Because notice, in the end of verse 23, he gets through the end Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things, there is no law. Meaning, there is no law. Like, I shouldn't have to tell you to do these things. And even in our culture, notice there are no laws in any culture on the planet against those nine things. It is not against the law in any culture, in any region, in any country to be more loving and more self-controlled, to be more gentle. Often, these are the things that are prized in culture. And so he's saying, listen, if you want to do these things, do them as much as you like. There is no limit on the amount of things that you could do. And even if some of these things, being kind and patient and peaceful and joyful, even if those things are seen as weakness, nobody sees any of these things as a threat. And so they will generously and openly welcome you into their life. But the other side of no law is meaning that you cannot legislate these things. The Holy Spirit can. He is the one who guides each and every one of these fruit. So, I want to tell you three things that really kind of dictate how we understand these fruit. First is this. Fruit should be visible in your life. If you are a follower of Christ, these things should be evident in you. That if someone were to say, hey, why don't you describe Walt, why don't, you describe, why don't you describe someone in your life? Describe They're a Christian, right? These are some of the things that they should describe. These words should come up in conversation. Man, they are so gentle. They are so kind. They're always so full of joy. These should be the markers, the traits that are used to describe us. They should be visible. It is one thing to say, you know, I'm a really patient person. And then everyone around you goes, mm, okay. That is not, it is not, well, I mean, I feel patient. I was more patient than I was yesterday. I mean, you know, I used to have, I used to have like a three second lead time before I get pissed off and it's now six seconds. So that's good. It's like, well, so it should be visible. Other people should be able to validate it. But here's 
probably one of the more frustrating things. I'll tell you the next two kind of frustrating things. The first is, when you read this list, notice that it says, in verse 22, but the fruit of the Spirit is. Notice anything about that? Singular. One fruit. Meaning, this list is not a la carte. You do not get to say, okay, I will be joyful and gentle, but not patient and not self-control. Sorry. It is all or nothing. So as we were going through that list, there are ones that are like, well, I'm not great at that, but I have an inner peace. So that should give me at least count for three. All or nothing. Singular. There is one thing that is produced in you. There is a fruit. And it manifests itself in all of these ways. Now, here's the last thing. This is the most important thing. When I start talking about fruit of the Spirit, and there are certain things that you in particular are not good at, and whatever cocktail of, cocktail of terrible that you have of the fruit that you're like, I'm, I'm not good at that, I'm not good at that. So here's what begins to happen. Is, is you begin to feel the weight of the law. I'm not a very patient person. I snap at my kids all the time. I don't really have any inner peace. I'm really not that kind. I have some enemies and I don't love them all that well. And then all of a sudden you start feeling guilt and shame and the weight of I need to be better. And listen to me, listen to me. If you walk out this door and go, all right, babe, well, I, I'm just gonna work on my patience. You missed the whole thing. You missed it all. That is not the point. The point is not to make sure you get better at these three things. And these things, these six things are good. These three things are bad. So I need to go home and work on these three things. That is not the point. Because notice he says fruit. When is the last time you saw an apple strain to come off of a tree? Never, not once. The apple doesn't, all right, here we go. Let's go. Work hard. No, the apple <laughs> simply exists because it is properly rooted. And when you want to get better fruit, you don't work on the fruit, you work on the roots. And you look at the tree and go, well, is the tree properly rooted? Is it properly watered? Is it properly maintained down here? Because if it is, then naturally this fruit's just gonna come out. But if there's some disconnection with the roots, if there's something not, it's not grounded properly, then that's probably why the fruit's not right. So if there is anything that I said in going through this list that you felt like, man, I just, that, that doesn't describe me at all, then rather than going and working on that one thing, rather than trying to get more patient, root yourself deeper in Christ. And then the fruit, singular, one for all, all or nothing, will be produced in your life. It is one of the more beautiful things that I get to do in my job is to see people. I was having a conversation with someone the other day and they were talking about faith and how it has just been kind of a struggle for them and then they gave their lives over to Christ and then they said, and I quote, and faith almost kind of, dare I say, became easy? I don't know. I'm sure we'll experience struggle, but it just, there was a, a breath of fresh ease to it. And I was like, yeah, he's called the Holy Spirit. That's kind of how that works. It's cool, huh? And they're like, yeah, yeah, it's kind of wild. And I'm like, yeah, it'll come and go. Not him, but your awareness of him. So just keep doing everything you can to lean in. The emotion, the emotion you should leave with, let me help you, is a yielding to the spirit, not a burden to do better. That is, if you get anything from today, if there's anything that's like, man, I just... Leave with the emotion to yield your life more to the Spirit of God rather than, man, I need to go work harder. I need to be nicer. I need to be more kind. I need to be, yeah, maybe. But that is evidence more of a yielding to the Spirit than you not doing good enough at the law. Amen? As we close this morning, I just encourage you to take some time and whatever that yielding to the Spirit looks like as we sing these songs of worship, to give yourself over to God so that he may begin to produce that kind of fruit 
in your life. God, we thank you so much for this morning and the, the reminder that there should be outward, visible, noticeable evidence in our life that you are God, that you have set up residence through your spirit in our life. God, I pray that that you would make your spirit alive within us in a way that we can actively tell the fruit that he is producing in us. And where we feel short, where we feel deficient, that rather than bear the weight of the burden of, oh, I need to do better, that it would be a reminder that now we need to dig deeper. And in the words of the Gospels, abide, rest in you rather than work for you. Jesus, we love you. We thank you for the invitation that you've given us this morning, and it's in your name we pray.